Okay, whoops. Um, okay, so welcome to Math 383 Complex Analysis. So this is lecture 12. And so what I want to do today is talk a little bit about singularities, but not too much. Uh, I really want to focus on probabilities, generating functions, and then do some more applications of what we've learned in evaluating some extremely difficult trig integrals, which I don't think you would know how to evaluate otherwise. And part of this is I want to balance uh, the different ways you can push complex analysis. I want to start seeing some applications of what we're doing. You know, why are we spending all of our time learning these theorems? Well, there's only finitely many hours, you know, in the semester. Um, I am happy to do a lecture as we climb up the mountain if anybody wants to add a little bit more time. So I'm not going to go into as much detail about singularities as we could. I will leave you to, you know, read the book about that, primarily because as a working mathematician, I don't really care that much, you know, all this, these different things don't really show up in the stuff that I'm using. And that's why I want to focus on some other things. So we'll talk a little bit about Riemann's removable singularity theorem. So for those of you who are keeping track, you know, he's finally on the board. Uh, the Cassarati Weierstrass, give some examples. And then as always, just talk about the dangers with infinity. All right, so again, I'm not gonna go into too much detail on singularities and poles and whatnot, just you know, stating it here for uh, completeness. And so as always, you know, we look at an open set, we want our function to be holomorphic, i.e. differentiable, i.e. analytic, except maybe at a couple of points. And the real question is how many can a couple be? You know, if it's a finite number, that's not too bad. If it's infinitely many in a finite set, what must be true about infinitely many points in a finite, in a bounded set? They have a convergent subsequence. And then we might have accumulations. And so there could be some issues if you have infinitely many points where things are happening. So we'll assume we have only finitely many places where the function blows up. And so the first is Riemann's theorem on removable singularities. Suppose we have a holomorphic function on an open set omega, except possibly at some point z naught. So we could always just zoom in at that point z naught. And other than that point z naught, as long as you're close, everything is fine. So if there's another point that's bad, it's well separated. We don't have a sequence of explosions. If f is bounded, then it turns out that this is a removable singularity. So let me give you an example of a removable singularity. So let's say I give you the function f of z is z minus 3 over z squared um, minus nine. Okay. When you look at this, where could this function be bad? So candidates for explosions, okay, they are z equals plus or minus three. So we can write f of z as z minus three over z minus three, z plus three, which is one over z plus three. So this function is actually well behaved near um, z equals three. Initially, when you look at this function, you say, oh, well, well, when I take z equals three, the denominator blows up. So this function might have a pole at z equals three. But when you look at it a little bit more carefully, you say, well, you know, why don't I just cancel the z minus three in the numerator with the z minus three in the denominator and look at this new function, one over z plus three. And this function is now defined for all z other than negative three. So this is what we mean by a removable singularity. By just doing something like this, we can still have um, a nice well-behaved function. You will not always be in a situation where you can do that. Okay. Um, so there are three types of singularities. You know, the first is the removable singularity, which we've just seen an example of. The next is a pole. So for pole, this would be something, for instance, um, you know, maybe a negative, you know, four, one over z to the fourth, plus a minus three, one over z cubed, and so on. And so this would be a pole of order four. It's telling us how deep do we need to go. 
which term do you think is the most important when we're doing this expansion? The negative one term. You know, we might care about what is the order of the pole, and that might have some information. But when we're doing integration, it's the negative one term that matters. And then essential singularities is basically everything else. So a lot of times for your definitions, you pull off or you extract a couple of things, and you say, and everything else we'll call this. So it's what's left over. And you have a beautiful theorem, which we're not going to you know, cover. There's other things I want to do instead. The casserati weierstrass theorem, which says, imagine you have a function that's holomorphic everywhere on a disk, except at the point z naught, and assume it has a essential singularity at z naught. Then when you look at what f does to a little neighborhood of z naught, it's dense in the complex plane. That means you give me any complex number, and I will find some input that's arbitrarily close to that under f. And you can make the disk as small as you want about z naught. You can keep making it smaller and smaller and smaller. I can still do this. I can't get every point. Does anybody have any suggestions on what might be a good function that has an essential singularity? Yes. E to the one over x squared or e to the minus x squared. Almost. Z squared, Z. right? And it doesn't really matter if we put in the plus one or the minus one you know, outside. So this is a function that would have an essential singularity. And you know, just trying to understand what this function is doing near the origin is a fascinating yet difficult problem. It's really not that hard to understand what a real valued function looks like. You know, I give you the input, which is a real number. The output is a real number. I can plot this in a two-dimensional space. If I want to understand what the plot of a complex valued function looks like, the input space is two dimensions. The output space is two dimensions, I need to be able to visualize in four dimensions. There are ways to do this. What you sometimes do is you sometimes can plot maybe the real part and the imaginary part, or you could plot the absolute value of the function. Sometimes people also use color to give you another sense of dimension, but it's very hard to just look at the plot of a complex valued function. And that's one of the reasons why these problems are so difficult. <coughs> I don't want to go into too much detail on this, out of curiosity, how many people have seen stereographic projection? Oh, good, a couple of people. So this is one way to try to fix things that are going on. So it's talking a little bit about what does it mean to have this point at infinity? So if you look at what's going on, when I gave you the function e to the negative or e to the one over z squared, well, when z is getting very, very close to zero, this is exploding and it's having a lot of trouble. I could change variables. And I could change variables, you know, I could let maybe w equal one over z, and then I would get uh, the function e to the w squared. But that function's really nice. Where is this function nice? Where, do, where would I do the Taylor series about? So where would I do the Taylor series of e to the w squared? About what point? w equals zero. So near w equals zero, this would be the standard Taylor series. So this is nice near w equals zero or z equals what? Infinity, right? And so if you think about what's going on, any point with absolute value getting larger and larger and larger, these are the points in the complex plane that are escaping to infinity. And you have to worry about, you know, how are you escaping to infinity? Is there more than one infinity? A nice way of viewing the complex plane, and there's you know, a couple of ways of doing this, is you can essentially put all the infinities at the North Pole. And you can project through the complex plane and see you know, uh, where am I hitting? So if there's time at the end of class today, I'll talk a little bit more about this. What I wanna do is I wanna focus today on some of the applications. And so what I want to do is just make sure we're all on board with some basic notions of probability. So we use capital letters for random variables. So X is a random variable with density either F or F sub X. We sometimes put the subscript if we want to remind ourselves that it's the density associated to the random variable F. The more random variables you have in play, the more difficult it is to know which goes with what. Yes. I'm sorry. Like the notation. 
That, that's just meant to show that it's a capital X, not a lowercase x. Yes. I'm about to show that. So it's sometimes hard to tell when somebody is writing. Are they writing a capital? And so uh, sometimes people do the, you know, the black bold face in tech. I have some colleagues who do not like to use that when they are... Um, no, I'm, I'm not going to get into that now. Right. Uh, at this time, at the end of the at this time, at the end of the class, I will talk about tech choices. So x is a random variable with density f or f sub x if the following is true. First, is the density function is non-negative. The second is the integral from minus infinity to infinity of f of x dx equals one, and the third, the probability that we take on a value between a and b is just the integral from a to b of the density. And this is one of the reasons why we care so much about probability distributions, is you know, if I want to find you know, what's the probability I take on a value between a and b, it's just the area under the curve from a to b. And now all of these techniques from calculus that allow us to calculate integrals, OK, we can now see one of the reasons for this. You can, of course, frequently numerically approximate a lot of these integrals, but if you can write them down in closed form and you have you know, parameters, you can then see well, what happens as I change the parameters. And that's extremely valuable. Most of the time, if I give you an integral, can you do it? No, no. We have to work really hard as professors to give you functions that you can integrate. What about finding derivatives? Yeah. I can't give you a nice function that you can't differentiate. You may not enjoy it, you know, that's not part of the deal, but you can just keep hitting it with, you know, do I use the chain rule? Do I use the product? You know, just keep hitting it and making it simpler and simpler and simpler and simpler. That's not going to be a challenge, but it's very easy to write down a function that you can't integrate in closed form. Is there any excuse for getting an integral wrong? You have the wrong answer for the integral. You can take the derivative, right? So it is inexcusable to have the wrong answer for an integral, OK? It's not quite at the level of rooting for the Yankees. It's close. It's competitive. Is there a justification for not knowing what the integral is? Yes, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. It's OK that you don't know in closed form what the integral is. Absolutely fine. But it is inexcusable to write down the wrong answer because you can always check by differentiating. So you should not ever have the wrong answer. Most of these integrals are going to be very hard to do. We want to show that the function integrates to 1. Well, as long as the integral is finite, I can always renormalize it to make it integrate to 1. So if it integrated to 3, OK, I multiply the density by the conjecture density by one third, and now everything is good. OK, so what I want to talk about is moment generating functions versus characteristic functions. We have talked before about the dangers with Taylor series. Um, so I went the wrong way. So you should hopefully remember from Taylor series, your f of x, if you're lucky, is the sum n goes from 0 to infinity of the nth derivative at 0 over n factorial x to the n. Does anybody remember the dangerous function? f of x is? Yeah. As all of the derivatives of this function at 0 are 0. This tells you that real analysis can be hard. Here is an infinitely differentiable function. The Taylor series exists for all x. The Taylor series converges for all x. And the only x for which your Taylor series agrees with your original function is when x equals 0, which really is not that impressive. Because when you consider the Taylor series, it's f of 0 plus multiples of x, x squared, x cubed. Those will all vanish at 0. So the Taylor series is forced to agree with the function at 0. And that is the only point at which they agree. This is horrible, right? You would expect that if I know a density, I'm sorry, if I, if I know the Taylor coefficients, I should, you know, I should know the function. 
It also tells you that if I give you a Taylor series, it doesn't uniquely specify the function. I could add any number of multiples of this to your function, and would it change the Taylor series? No. So unfortunately, so note e to the x and 1701 f of x plus e to the x have the same Taylor series. I could even do um, 1701 f of x to the 24601 power, and that would still have the same Taylor series. That's horrible. Complex analysis will not allow something like that to happen. All right, so what we want to do now is I want to talk about moment generating functions. What do you think the moment generating function gives you? The moments, right? At this point, if you have no idea what a moment is, that's fine. But with a name like moment generating function, you should be able to figure out what it's going to give you, All right? So let's define what the moments are. And so I'm going to the nth moment, uh, mu n, will be defined to be the expected value of the nth power of x, which is just the integral from minus infinity to infinity of x to the n, f of x dx. And the hope is the moments determine the density. So if life were nice, if I knew all the moments, then I would know what the density is. It's basically, I should be able to recover the density by knowing the moments. What's the first moment that you hear of? It has a special name. Um, the mean. And related to the second moment is the, the variance. And then the next ones, you get the skewness and the kurtosis. These start to give you information about the shape of the distribution. So the question is, do you think that if you know all the moments that that will uniquely determine the density? No, it's very similar to the Taylor issue. That just because we know the Taylor coefficients, it's not enough. The Taylor coefficients are basically giving us derivatives, integer derivatives. A discrete set over here, we're getting you know, integer powers. It's not enough. If we actually considered more general moments where you replace n with, say, a real number r, and if we knew the moments along a sequence that converged and accumulated, what theorem might we be able to use? Uh, I forgot what it's called, but the one where the complex is something that's like globally equal every thing. Right, the accumulation theorem, okay. right? This is what I was trying to say, accumulate, to just give a little yeah. hint as to what the word is. That's one of the reasons why we care so much about the accumulation theorem. If we can prove the moments are equal along a sequence that accumulates, then the densities have to be the same. And this is how you can make the subject rigorous. So we want to calculate the moment. Right. So let's consider the following. Oops. So let's define the moment generating function to be the expected value of e to the tx. This is going to be the integral from minus infinity to infinity of e to the tx f of x dx. So I want to calculate this integral. Now, I haven't told you what f is. I want to somehow evaluate this integral in terms of the moments of f. Anybody have any thoughts about how we might be able to expand this? You can do a Taylor series maybe inside the integral. Sure. Which, which should we Taylor expand? e to the tx. Sure. Why not? And you, you seem like there's something you want to do, like Taylor expanding it. You know, it's, a, it's a nice start, but it seems like you want to do more than just Taylor expand it. Order yeah, order. let's switch the order of integration, right? So this would be the same as the sum, n goes from 0 to infinity, the integral um, from minus infinity to infinity of x to the n, f of x dx. I have a 1 over n factorial and I have a t to the n. What is this equal over here? The moments. The moments. This is why it's called the moment generating function. If you calculate this, the Taylor coefficients of this are your moments. 
And now you can just pick off the moments by knowing the moment generating function. That's nice. Okay. Let's consider f of x is one over one plus x squared, or if you really want one over pi, one over one plus x squared. You know, we've looked at this function before. Um, I need the one over pi so that it integrates to one. So we can try to calculate the moment generating function. So if I try to calculate the moment generating function of this, it'd be the integral from minus infinity to infinity of e to the tx, one over one plus x squared dx. And what can you tell me about this integral? Well, I, I want to integrate e to the tx times one over one plus x squared. Can anybody give me a value of t where you can do this? Zero. Okay, and what will you get when it's zero? Pi. Pi if t equals zero. And what if t is not zero? Let's say t equals one. So you have e to the tx over one plus x squared. What happens as x gets large and positive? E is dominant. This, the integrand is never negative. So this is going to blow up if t is positive as we go to you know, positive values of x. If t is negative, it blows up if x goes into the negative range. So infinity every other place. So the moment joining function only exists at t equals 0. If you want to study something, it's a nice benefit if it actually exists. Much harder to study things that don't exist. So is it impressive that the moment joining function exists when t equals 0? No. When you take t equals 0, you're just taking the expected value of 1. You're just integrating 1 times your density. Well, the density is defined so that it integrates to 1. It's not a big deal that you know, the moment joining function exists this means it does not exist in a neighborhood of t equals zero. It only exists for that one value. And so unfortunately, uh, there's a lot of results in probability that are very nice if you happen to have the moment generating function existing, but the moment generating function does not always exist. So rather than studying the moment generating function, which may not exist, we instead study something that does exist. Uh, any George Carlin fans here? Uh, one of his best routines is flying on an airline. And one of my favorite parts is when they say, you know, please check the immediate seating vicinity for any items you may have bought on board. He goes, I may have bought on board my grand piano, but I didn't, so I'm not going to look for it. I'm going to look for the items I did bring on board. The generating function, beautiful, it's wonderful, it's nice, but it doesn't always exist. So we need to study something that does exist. And what we're going to study is the characteristic function. And that's going to be the expected value of e to the i tx. So the integral from minus infinity to infinity of e to the i tx f of x dx. This is also, we'll talk much more about this later, essentially the Fourier transform. There are at least three different definitions of the Fourier transform. And for those of you who do physics, you may have a slightly different definition than the one I like. I actually like the ones with a two pi. Actually, I like the one with a negative two pi. Um, but essentially it's just simple rescaling to get from one to another. What's nice about this is e to the i tx, when you know x and t are real, this always has absolute value one. So the absolute value of the integral is less than equal to the integral of the absolute value. This is less than equal to the integral of the absolute value of f. Well, f is non-negative. So taking the absolute value of f, not a big deal. This always exists. So that's a huge benefit 
of the characteristic function over the moment generating function. We always have it available to study. Okay, so it turns out it makes a tremendous difference putting an I there. Okay, so let's consider, let's do a specific example. Let's do f of x equals e to the negative x for x non-negative. So if I want to calculate the moment generating function, it's the expected value of e to the tx. This is going to be the integral from minus infinity to infinity of e to the tx f of x dx. But I tell you that it's equal, the density is e to the negative x. If x is non-negative, it's zero. Otherwise, this is just the same as integrating from zero to infinity. e to the tx, and I have e to the negative x dx. All right. So this is e to the negative 1 minus t x dx. I'm just combining the exponentials. Any thoughts about how we should do this integration? Change of variables. So let's let u, whoa. So let's let u equal one minus t times x. So du is one minus t dx. X goes from zero to infinity. Where does u go from? <sighs> Depends on t. If 1 minus t is greater than 0. I'm sorry? Then we go from 0 to infinity. Why do I want 1 minus t to be greater than 0? Well, if 1 minus t was negative, then it would have e to a positive power. What would be true about this integral? Divergence. So clearly, we need one minus t to be greater than zero, else the integral diverges. So whenever you're doing calculations, you've always got to be very careful. This integration only exists if one minus t is greater than zero. So I need t to be less than one. Okay. So now if I were to do the integration, um, I would now get that this is equal to the integral u goes from 0 to infinity, e to the minus u, and then dx is the same as du over 1 minus t. So this is just 1 over 1 minus t. And I'll leave you to just you know, finish and, and check the integration, but I'm essentially integrating e to the minus u from 0 to infinity that just integrates to 1. We were able to calculate the moment generating function. So here, the moment generating function of x is one over one minus t if t is less than one and undefined otherwise. Okay, yes. From the first, sorry, from the second line to the third line, like why do we change uh, the negative infinity to zero? This line? Uh, sorry, uh, yeah. Oh, because my function is equal to zero outside of the non-negatives. So the integral is value. Right, so, so f of x is equal to e to the negative x if x is greater than or equal to 0, 0 if x is less than 0. That's why we're able uh, to drop the integral from minus okay. infinity to 0. OK? So this allows me to calculate the moment generating function. The moment generating function exists as long as t is less than 1. It turns out for a lot of issues in probability, this is actually enough. Uh, what's good about this is that the moment generating function exists in a neighborhood of the most important value of t. What's the most important value of t? One. Nope. What? Zero. Oh. Right. The most important value of t is zero because that, that gives you the expected value of one. And so if we were to plot where everything is, is defined, here's zero, um, you know, here's one. It would be in this range over here. This is where the moment generating function would exist. Since it exists in a neighborhood of the origin, it turns out in probability you can do a lot with this. 
We just need to have things that are well-defined in a small neighborhood. For the function we looked at a moment ago, uh, this was only defined at t equals zero. It was not defined anywhere else. That's why this is an absolutely terrible function. Okay. So let's try to look at the Cauchy of the moment, the moment joining function, the Cauchy distribution. This is the one over one plus x squared. Or if you want to be more accurate, one over pi, one over one plus x squared. We already showed that the moment joining function does not exist for the Cauchy, right? Let's consider the characteristic function. I'm not, I'm not going to really worry about the pi. So let's calculate the expected value of e to the i tx. That's going to be the integral from minus infinity to infinity of e, oops, should be capital X, e to the i tx over 1 plus x squared. Now, if you want, we could write this as cosine tx plus i sine tx over 1 plus x squared dx. What can I ignore in the numerator? The imaginary part. So note, imaginary part is odd, can drop. We can keep it if we want. Yeah. Sometimes it's more convenient to keep it. But I know 1 over 1 plus x squared is an even function. Sine of tx is an odd function. It's well behaved. OK. So let's use contour integration to evaluate this. So we need to come up with some function f of z. Can anybody give me a suggestion for f of z? So one possibility is to do cosine. There's another possibility. Not ix. Not e to the z. Itz over z squared plus one. We could have done cosine. And if we did cosine of tz over z squared plus one with you know cosine of theta is e to the i theta plus e to the minus i theta divided by two. Right, I mean, there's really no benefit in doing cosine. We're going to have two factors. One of them is going to explode in the upper half plane. One of them is going to explode in the bottom. Let me just do e to the i tz. Now, depending on what t is, that determines whether or not you want to go in the upper half plane or the lower half plane. For now, we'll assume t is greater than zero. If t is less than zero, it's similar. And so what I'm going to do now is here's minus r, here's r. I'm going to come along like this, and then I'm going to come back. And so for my function, f of z is e to the itz over z squared plus 1. Where are the poles? Good. Are right. right. at z equals i and z equals minus i. So of these, only the pole at i is going to matter in terms of the contribution. If we look at the integral from minus r to r, that's going to essentially give us the integral we want. What do you think is going to be true on the semicircle? Yes. Yeah, because if you think about what's going on on the semicircle, we have e to the i t z over z squared plus one. So on semicircle, The absolute value of f of z is going to be less than or equal to e to the i t z over z squared minus 1. And again, you just have to be a little bit careful because the worst thing for us could be if z squared is a pure negative number. Well, e to the i t z, um, that's actually going to equal e to the minus t y over z squared minus 1. 
if z equals x plus i y. And this is why we can see that if we're in the if t is positive, this fact is going to be exponentially small. What's the length approximately of the arc from minus r to r, from r to minus r? Yeah, two r is fine. Pi r is fine. Yeah, it's of order r, right? So the contribution from integrating on the semicircle, we're going to multiply it by at most its length. And the function is essentially bounded by one over r squared. I don't really care about the minus one. So you're going to get you know, r over r squared. That's going to go to 0 as r goes to infinity. So the contribution from the semicircle is going to be negligible. We need to now figure out what is the contribution from the pole. And you know, this is the Cauchy formula. So what we're really doing here. We're coming down like this, swinging over here, and we've got our pole at i, minus r and r. You know, if you want, we can, as always, you know, come down, go around, counterclockwise, come back. We've done this enough times that we now know that the integral um, from minus r to r of you know f of z dz plus the integral over the semicircle of radius r, f of z dz is just one over two, is just two pi i times the a to the minus one piece at i. And we often write this as the residue um, of the function f at the point i. So, when we're doing the Taylor series, we only care about what's going on at that point. The reason we have the 2 pi i is we don't have 1 over 2 pi i of the integral. So we just have to figure out what is the residue of this function. So what we want to do is we want to take e to the i t z over z squared plus 1 and write that as a to the negative 1 of z minus i to the negative 1 plus a 0 z minus i to the zeroth power, plus a1, z minus i, plus a2, z minus i squared, and so on and so on. So we want to figure out what is the negative first coefficient. There's a couple of ways to do this. So we can note that f of z, it's e to the i t z over z squared plus 1, I can write this as e to the i t z over z plus i, uh, 1 over z minus i. And I only care about the coefficient in front of z minus i. So if I expand this first piece out, you know, this function is holomorphic, right? So when I expand this out, it's going to be b0 plus b1 z minus i plus b2 z minus i squared plus dot dot dot. What's the only piece that's going to matter? b0. All I need is b0. What's b0? Is just, yes. So it's going to be e to the i t i divided by i plus i or it's going to be e to the minus t over 2i. Yes? So as r goes to infinity, we get the integral from minus infinity to infinity of e to the i t x over x squared plus 1. Because again, if we're on the real axis, you know, z is just x. The semicircle is just going to be 0. So that's going to be 2 pi i times the negative 1 term. That's going to be e to the minus t over 2i. So it's going to be pi e to the minus t. So my claim is this is reasonable. So can somebody give me one reason why this is reasonable?
Yes. Excellent. So we get pi at t equals zero. Good. There's another check you can do that seems that this is reasonable. You can actually think of two more checks. Yes. Well, this is a finite number, but it's more than just a finite number. Well, well that, that's when t equals zero. Yes. Like for any OK. So it's always going to be finite. It's real valued. So notice that this is always a real number. You know, I've got complex numbers all over the place. It's real. And the last is, as t goes to infinity, it goes to 0. Because what is, happens as t goes to infinity? Um, it's going to have a lot of oscillations. This is going to be cosine tx. If you wanted one that's a little bit harder, is that not only is it real, it's actually positive. Because if you think about what's going on, cosine is largest at zero. And so the exponential is going to be getting smaller the further you go from the origin. And so when cosine is negative, that's going to be hit with a smaller value of the exponential. So I'll let you really think about these points. But whenever you do calculations, it's always nice if you can stop at the end of the day and see, do I believe the answer? Does it look reasonable? And this passes several smell tests. It equals pi at zero. It's real valued. It's positive. It's decaying as t gets large, and I'm getting more and more oscillation, more and more cancellation. OK. Yes. Yes. Uh, so, like in a power series expansion of e to the i t over t squared of constant, why do we only care about like all those terms up to the power negative one? Why do we not care about like those? Well, because well, because when we do integrals, you know, we have the Cauchy formula. The integral of a function along a closed curve oh. is equal to just the negative first term. If there were multiple oh. poles. Only care about the power negative. Correct. Oh. And so just you know, a little bit more generally, if I have say f of z is you know a of z b of z, if b of z is say you know z minus z naught to the negative three plus two z minus z naught to the negative two plus eight z minus z naught to the negative one plus dot, 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 dot. When I look at A of Z, I can write that as maybe, you know, A zero plus A one Z minus Z naught plus A two Z minus Z naught squared and so on and so on and so on. And when I look at their product, I only care about the things that give me a one over Z. And so now, how do I get a z minus z naught, a one over z minus z naught? I could have a naught times, in this case, it'd be eight z minus z naught to the negative one. Or I could have a one um, z minus z naught times two z minus z naught to the negative two. Or I could have the a2 z minus z naught squared times z minus z naught to the negative three. And that's the only way things can combine and give me something that's a one over z. So I don't actually need the entire Taylor series expansion of a of z. I would just need three terms and combine them like this. The problem we had was much easier because for the problem we had, b of z did not have a pole of order three, it had a pole of order one, so there was only one term that emerged. Okay, so this allows us to calculate the Fourier transform of Cauchy's distribution. So even though the moment generating function is horrible, the, the characteristic function is very nice. Okay, 
So we've finished that calculation. So what I want to do for the last like five minutes is talk a little bit about some trig integrals we can do. And so I've put some Mathematica code. Uh, if you've never used assumptions and whatnot in elements, uh, this is a way for you to specify to Mathematica where things live. And so we're integrating things to the form, you know, one over a plus cosine theta. Now, if you think about this, what value should a have so that things are nice? Well, I want a to be at least one in absolute value so that the denominator is never zero. And as long as a is greater than one in absolute value, we're fine. You could consider the more general, you know, alpha plus beta cosine theta. Well, I can just pull out a beta. And so this is the same as table of integrals. I'm not going to do everything. I'm going to assume you've just done some bookkeeping to make things a little bit nicer. So if I ask Mathematica to integrate, uh, it gives me an answer involving the floor of arguments and whatnot. If you then tell it that A is greater than one and it's a real number, then Mathematica knows how to simplify it. And there's lots of different ways of you know, trying to give this information to Mathematica in terms of how it handles things. So what I want to do is I want to briefly talk about how would you do integrals like this? So let's say I want to integrate you know, d theta over a plus cosine theta. One possibility is I can write you know, cosine theta is e to the i theta plus e to the minus i theta over two, and I can try to play complex games. Another thing I can do is on the unit circle, you know, z equals e to the i theta, and what is e to the minus i theta? It is the complex conjugate, but there's another way of writing it. One over z. So on the unit circle, I can write cosine theta as z plus one over z divided by two. So our integral from zero to two pi of d theta over a plus cosine theta is the same as the integral over the unit circle. So if z is e to the i theta, what would dz be? i e to the i theta d theta. So what would d theta be? Minus i 1 over z dz. Yes. So this would then become minus i over z dz. And the denominator would become a plus 1 half z plus 1 over z, right? So I can pull out the minus i. I have integral over the unit circle. I can bring the z downstairs. And um, maybe I'll multiply through by 2 to clean the denominator. So I don't have that 2 down there. So I'll have a minus 2i. I'll have dz upstairs, and then I'll have a z squared plus 2az plus 1, if I've done everything correctly. So now we're integrating this function over the unit circle. Do you think we can integrate this function over the unit circle? I'm sorry? And so here, as long as a is greater than one, we're going to be in good shape. Yeah, and so we can we can find where the poles are. So find poles z plus is one over or the zeros of you know basically. If you want x squared plus 2ax plus 1, if you want to use x rather than z. This is just a quadratic. Is it hard to find zeros of a quadratic? No. We can actually evaluate this and now use Cauchy's theorem. So as an exercise, try to finish the calculation. 
But we can now calculate things like the integral of one over a plus cosine theta. I am not gonna be able to find the antiderivative of that. But we can do that integral in closed form. If I gave you cosine squared rather than cosine, could we do it? Of course. All that would change is that instead of having z plus one over z, we would have z plus one over z squared. Not a big deal. All of a sudden, all of these problems become trivial. We just have to find the zeros of the polynomial and then find the residues there. So this should hopefully give you a sense of just how powerful complex analysis is. First, the objects it wants to study exist. That's a nice plus. And second, we can actually compute them. But only if we do a complete integral. We can't do partial integrals. All right, so this is a good place to stop.